Thank you and good afternoon everyone. It's really nice to be back here at Aalto Yliopisto. This is my own university, although back in the days it was called Helsinki University of Technology. I graduated from the building next year, so it's always very nice to come back here to, to Otaniem. And today I will talk a little bit about cyber defense. So can you hear me now? So I will talk about uh, cyber defense. I actually work at the Finnish Defense Forces at the Defense Command. And I'm going to give you an overview about cyber defense and also what's the difference between cyber defense and cyber security and a little bit that about the things that are going on today and maybe what we will see in the, in the future. So if we start with just talking about the cyber threat, usually you get the question that is there something new about this? And I would say yes and no. No, in the sense that if we look back in the history, I mean, we have seen incidents before. So going back, for example, to the 1980s, 1990s, you could see a lot of people having this like a hobby to do a little bit of hacking and maybe changing some, some code and cracking into games and so on. But the purpose during those times was not so much to do harm to others, but rather to improve your skill set and kind of get a good reputation among other people who were having the, the same hobby. So it was, it was more or less on a small scale. And if people did something that maybe influenced organizations, it was more meant as pranks and not so much to really do actual harm. But then when we came more towards the 2000 uh, and the new century, then we started to see things change because obviously also the societies, especially the Western societies changed. The societies beca became much more digitalized and more and more things moved into the internet or we used technologies to support, uh, support us in everyday they needs. And then we started to see a rise with uh, cyber crime and especially organized crime because they started to realize that this is a very good way to actually make money. It's cheap, it's relatively easy, you, you don't get caught. Even if you do get caught, there might not be a legislation that will actually put you before a trial and make, get you convicted. So this was a very lucrative field for, for many criminals. And also, we saw the rise of hacktivism. So now, for example, those who usually had been doing things more as a hobby now started to have other goals, for example, ideological goals or political goals uh, and so on. Then as time went by, we started to see much and more uh, more much and much more activities from nation states. So you could see intelligence agency gathering information also from cyberspace and from the cyber environment perhaps making some computer breakings to collect more information and so on. And also armed forces started to realize that it actually brings you a lot of possibility to also operate in the cyber domain. So not just focusing on traditional warfare or not only focusing on the info domain, which had been, been up to that point talking about information warfare, but now actually the cyber domain could enable you to do military operations in, in new ways. So that started to also rise. And if you look at the things, the situation today, we can more or less say that everyone is involved in cyberspace, one way or the other. So we have the typical cyber crime. We have uh, cyber warfare as an issue. We have the hacktivists and so on and so forth. And also this thing is getting much more broader. So it's not only about cyber. We can talk about hybrid warfare and also, again, the new rise of information warfare. Now I put terrorists with a question mark because you often hear the term cyber terrorism. And uh, well, terrorist organizations do use the internet and they do understand these means. But I still don't like to talk about cyber terrorism just yet because I think that what cyber terrorism would really be is that you would get the same impact through cyberspace that you would through a conventional terrorist attack. So let's take as an example that the terrorist organization would hijack some planes and fly into some buildings. We see the explosions that creates terror and fear in all of us. And that then supposedly changes the political decision making. So the analogy of cyber terrorism would be that rather than hijacking the plane physically, you would hack into the plane and then fly that plane into the building and we would again see the explosions and so on. And this we haven't per se seen done yet, so that's why I use terrorists with a question mark. 
But that doesn't mean that terrorist organizations don't use in the internet or use the cyberspace, for example, to get money or uh, communicate and plan operations and do, for example, information operations and so on. So looking at the cyber threat, it's not a new thing, but uh, the way it impacts us today is in, on a much broader scale than, let's say, 20 years ago. So in that sense, there are a lot of new things happening. If we talk about cyber security, then it's something that actually affects the whole society. We are all of us are, f for example, very much dependent on our critical infrastructure. So let's say that the banking world would go down, the finance sector would be down, money wouldn't go, you can't get money out of the bank, you can't pay when you go and buy your food, you don't get any salary. I mean, the society would really suffer quite a bit from this. Or let's look at the energy sector. For example, let's say there are some disturbances there. How many of you would like, for example, in January or February, be without heating here in Finland or Northern Europe? I don't think that many. Or, for example, the transport sector. Uh, a lot of, for example, countries are very much dependent on their import, and a lot of import is coming, for example, by sea, um, or most import comes by sea. So let's say that there would be a disturbance somewhere in the harbor. The ships would come in, but you would have no means of getting the goods off the ships because the systems are a mess and they would basically rot in there and not move anywhere. That could cause a lot of disturbances to society. The health sector, what if there's something wrong with the hospital systems? And there was actually one interesting case study. There was a hospital that said that they are very much prepared, let's say that there would be some disturbances with the electricity. The electricity goes down, so yes, they have their backup systems. Okay, but what when the backup systems go down? Well, we get more energy because we have this deal with uh, this gas station, which is on the other side of the street. Okay, so let's go and ask the gas station, that how do your pumps work? Well, by electricity. So that's that, and so forth. So we are really dependent on the critical infrastructure, not only the critical infrastructure, more and more of the things we do every day uh, are based on technology. And this will only evolve in the future when we are going into Internet of Things, we are using 5G, etc. So more and more of our, uh, of our daily lives will be dependent on these technologies. And this is where cybersecurity comes in. Uh, this is where we as a society have to kind of prepare for the possible threats and we have to be resilient against them and we actually have to assume that, that we are going to be attacked and we still have to be able to continue to function. So this is something that comprises us all. And nobody is actually able to alone tackle these threats. So that's why we need collaboration, for example, between the various authorities, between the private sector, and a lot of the know-how is actually in the private sector, between academia, where there's new research and a lot of new know-how is created, and also third sector parties. So this is something, we are all in the same boat, so we need to cooperate on, on these things. And this is something that most countries have realized, some before others, and the first thing that many nations have done is to create a national cyber security strategy and many countries have already come out with their second or their third cyber security strategy. And for example, in Finland, our first uh, cyber security strategy came out in 2013, and just last week we had a revision of it, so now Finland's second cyber security strategy came out. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was on the 3rd of October. You can find it on the, on the internet. And if you are interested in seeing, for example, the other cybersecurity strategies in Europe, then you can go to ENISA, which lists a lot of them, and also the CCDCOE in Tallinn has quite a comprehensive list of the cybersecurity strategies on a more global level. But when you look at the cybersecurity strategies, many of them have realized uh, that, or been thinking about the threat in more or less the same way, they have come up with quite similar solutions. Of course, it's everyone tailored to each nation's need. And uh, at least in the earlier days, the biggest major difference between the cybersecurity strategies were actually how they define cybersecurity. But if you look at the uh, strategic guidelines of the Finnish cybersecurity strategy, then the new strategy, it's short and it's more compact than the previous one, but it also relies still on the one that came out in 2013. 
So many of the things that were talked about in 2013 are still relevant. So there are, for example, a model on how we should everyone work together, the comprehensive approach, so the authorities, private sector, uh, critical infrastructure, and so on. Uh, we talked very much about situational awareness and who and how to come up with uh, situational awareness in cyberspace. We talked, for example, about how to fight cybercrime and the role of the police. We talked about cyber defense and the role of the defense forces. Uh, there was uh, talk about, uh, for example, legislation. One crucial element of that was were also the intelligence laws that now, now were passed a year ago. And also there were discussions about, for example, international collaborations, etc. So the current strategy of 2019 very much builds upon these. But now I would say that they have, uh, they are focusing on three major things. So one of the things is, for example, this international collaboration. So Finland, of course, is not alone. And this is something that many other countries also are talking about, that no country is alone when we are talking about cybersecurity. We need the help and we need the collaboration of, of other countries. And for example, when it comes to Finland, we are a member of the European Union. So of course, the, the European Union framework is, is very important to, for us. So to collaborate within the European context and also be part of the, the concepts and frameworks that are being created in the European Union. And when it comes to these aspects, we are also talking about certain aspects where we like to, to improve ourselves. So for example, the ability to, to monitor our cyber environments, creating cyber awareness, uh, and so on and so forth. Then another aspect is, um, is competence. Uh, and when it comes to competence, we really need a lot of know-how in this area. Cyber is not so much about buying equipment and put it somewhere and magic happens, but it's about what people know on different levels. So we can talk about the everyday know-how that, for example, your grandmothers need to have up to the cyber spe specialists or to the people who are in leadership positions, etc. So here, for example, th that we need to put money on education and also put money on research to be really a forerunner or among the forerunners in this field. And then, of course, there's about the management. So how do we manage this strategy? And here, one crucial element will be the implementation plan. And in many cases, you could say that an implementation plan is in one sense more important than the strategy itself because with the implementation plan, usually then also, then we start to talk about, okay, how much money and resources are we actually going to put in place? And if we don't put money and resources into actually implementing the strategy, then the strategy is nothing more than nice, nice and beautiful talks. But let's hope for a very good implementation strategy. So now going into cyber defense as the military aspect of cyber security. So Typically, the armed forces have been fighting their wars uh, on land, on s in the sea, and in the air. And these are the traditional war fighting domains. Now the cyber domain comes in as, as one other domain. And why I didn't draw it here in parallel with the other domains is that not only is it a domain in itself, but it also goes very much into all the other domains. If you, for example, look at the armed forces, the armed forces or the, the army, the army is very much digitized in today's world. That's the same thing goes for the Navy. You have a lot of systems that are, are used uh, like C4ISR systems and, and so on. And also if you look at the Air Force, if you look at the fighter jets of, of today's world, I mean, they are technology. So the military and modern war fighting is more and more about technology and where we have technology, well, then we are already in the cyber domain, and that's where you can influence things. So cyber is a domain in itself, but it's also very much a cross-domain. So it affects the, the land, the, the sea, and the air domains. And if you're talking about building cyber power, I would actually like to compare it to how air power was built in time. So for example, if we go back in time, 100, 200 years ago, then the situation was pretty much like that, that the wars were fought on land or 
uh, on sea, in the sea. So then there were people who started to talk about, hey, we could have these flying vessels and we could start to fight wars also, also in the air. And in the beginning, there were a lot of doubts that is this really relevant? I mean, we have always been doing is this in a certain way. Why should we start doing things in a new way? Why should we use the, the air element? Is it just the, you know, too enthusiastic air people who, is, who are having big dreams and so on? So is this really relevant for, for war fighting? Then there was a discussion about the moral dilemma, that is it fair? I mean, we have always been fighting like this, uh, on land or on the sea, so is it fair to also take this air element in? And then there were the legal question that, okay, what is allowed? Can we do intelligence, reconnaissance operations? Can we bomb from the air or can we do whatever? And actually the first uh, aircrafts that were used in a warfare situation, it was back in the late 1800th century and they were balloons that went over enemy lines to, to do some reconnaissance work. Uh, after that, they started to put people with some stones and things to throw off the balloons, so that could then comprise this bombing. Of course, during those times, it wasn't, wasn't that effective, but when we start to come to the First and Second World War, then you saw a really big development when it comes to fighting wars also in the air domain. And if you look at the state of the art, from then, then nobody would question the existence of an air force, except maybe the army or the navy, but that's another thing. So looking at the things from, from building, then from a cyber perspective, building cyber power, there was very much the same discussion going on, from doubts to legal discussions to moral discussions, etc. And it was not a very long time ago when experts were talking about the possibilities for having cyber domain, for fighting also wars in the cyber domain. And the expert were told that you are just fantasizing. This is something for science fiction novels and you are nerds and uh, you, your fantasy is, is too wild. Then came the moral discussions that, okay, is this fair? Is it fair to actually sneak into some system and crash it or steal information or, or whatever you would like to, to do? Then came the legal discussions, okay, but if these things are possible, then what can you do? What are you not allowed to do? Where is the gray area? And actually the gray area here was very big because of course, cyber is much more abstract if you compare to the other domains. So it was very difficult to say that, okay, this is very clear, this is, these are the things that where you have free, but and here are the things you cannot in practice do. But pretty quickly, the legal, or most of the le big legal questions were tackled and it, we came to the conclusion on an international level that international law applies and it's, if you talk about warfare, then whatever rules that apply for war also applies when we are talking about using cyber as a domain. So if you look at the state of the art today, then cyber is in many cases recognized as a domain most nations or many armed forces are developing capabilities in the cyber domain and some nations have also been using these capabilities. There are still some issues that are open or semi-open. For example, one is uh, attribution. Because if you, let's say that if you do something in a traditional sense, then you pretty much can attribute who it was. Who sent the missile, who did the attack. This is not the case necessarily in the cyber domain. It might, the one doing or launching a cyber attack might not want to shout out that, hey, it was us, and it might be very difficult to attribute and prove that, okay, this attack was done by, by this nation or this criminal group. It's not impossible, and I will come to that a little bit later, but it's, um, it's difficult. And also then there's the question of countermeasures because many times when you talk about cyber, people have this idea that somebody attacks you with a cyber operation and then someone does another cyber operation back. This is not necessarily the case and nor is it necessarily the, the reasonable thing to do. And then also even if it were, it might not be that easy. So yes, countermeasures are possible, but not necessarily the, the straightforward way to do. 
Then there's also a question about deterrence. So if we talk about deterrence in a normal case, what you basically want to is that you have a certain threshold that is high enough so that an enemy or opponent thinks that that threshold is so high that if you start to come over that threshold, you will suffer a great loss. So basically, you know that if you are going to attack someone, you, will, you might or you will, with a some prob probability, get beaten up. And that will deter you from actually doing the attack. It's a little bit like if you would go out late at night and someone comes and wants to fight with you. I mean, if you're a, if you're a big guy, then maybe the attacker thinks that it's not maybe a good idea to start start a fight with you or not, but uh, but it's a little bit the same analogy. So how do you keep the deterrence high enough so that that the opponent doesn't want to attack you? What does this mean in cyberspace? What does I mean? Is it the attribution that is the case that okay if we do this we will get caught? Do we care? Or if we do this then the repercussions to us will be high enough. And actually, do th does the deterrence actually come from the cyber domain or from some other domain, etc.? So this whole deterrence issue is still open. And then also, what is the threshold for a kinetic response? That is, if, for example, you get hit by a cyber attack, will you respond by sending a missile back? And we have seen this happening. So this is already on the table, I would say, one year ago, five years ago, this threshold was considered to be pretty high. I mean, could you really respond like that? So there's a lot of things going on in this cyber world all the time, and things that we consider that are maybe not relevant today could be very much relevant in a year from now or five years from now. So things are happening, happening fast. Looking a little bit at a few examples, especially where we have seen uh, state-based uh, activities, one is called the Suter from 2017, and this was allegedly a situation where there was an air operation done by Israel to Syria. And basically they flew in, took 30 minutes, they bombed the facilities they wanted to bomb and flew out. But what happened at the same time was a cyber operation where allegedly they were able to manipulate the air surveillance systems of the Syrians so that this airstrike was not seen or there might even have been false, false targets in this um, situational awareness picture. So this was kind of an example of a combined air and cyber operation. And this was as early as 2007. In the same year, we saw one case that there was a lot about in the news, and that was about the Tallinn bronze statue incident. So you're probably all familiar with this case. Uh, in Estonia, in Tallinn, they wanted to, to move the bronze statue from one place to another place. And this caused a lot of riots, physical riots in the street. But at the same time, there started to be a lot of cyber incidents in Tallinn, attacking, for example, banks and attacking the infrastructure. Technically, these were very simple attacks, so we were talking about denial of service attacks, but looking at where the attacks technically came from, I believe it was from I mean, well over 100, 150, 190 countries all around the world. So, so of course, technically, it, it was very simple. It was a denial, a distributed denial of, of service attack, but it had huge impact for Estonia and during that time. And at some point, they were pretty much shutting down uh, some of the connections also outwards from Estonia. Uh, Estonia, in those days, attributed this attack to, to Russia, although technically not, not many of the, the attacks seemed to come from Russia, but of course, that doesn't mean anything. And of course, Russia denied its involvement. And uh, well, this was, uh, in those days, I th would say, one of the incidents that got the world's eyes open to the fact that these attacks can be uh, targeting a whole country and it, they can be attributed to another country. One year later, there was the war in Georgia and pretty similar types of attacks were, were discovered during, during that time. Then another interesting case also during those uh, days where the Conficker worm in 2008 and 2009. This was um, a worm that was spreading pretty fast 
it seemed that it was originated from Ukraine. It did a lot of damage, but it didn't do so much as it basically could have done. And it be it's believed that the reason was that it got so much attention and started to spread faster than the ones launching the worm had actually an uh, anticipated. So they wanted to then keep a low profile. And that's why the worm didn't, didn't do much more harm than it did, but it did do a lot of harm. And it was a very interesting worm also in the sense that, for example, it targeted or it, got, it infected the networks, for example, from the, the British military, the French military, the German military, and so on. And there was, for example, a case in, in France that uh, the French military were not able to download some of their flight plans which caused their air airplanes, their fighter planes, to be grounded. Now, from an armed forces point of view, if your aircraft is grounded, then this is operationally a very bad thing. So this was just the results of one, one worm, and not to mention what cleaning up this mess then later on would cost. There was actually a claim in those days that also the Finnish Defense Forces would have gotten this worm, but this was, this was actually false news. I don't know where that claim, claim really came from, but we were not infected with that, with that worm. But many systems in those days were, were vulnerable. Then, of course, in 2010 came the Stuxnet, and I'm sure you have all heard about the Stuxnet. So this was very much a state-based attacks that uh, were targeting the nuclear facilities in Iran. Very targeted, jump the air gap. And basically, it hit the centrifuges and or the automatic systems that were spinning the centrifuges and made the centrifuges spin with different speeds so that the centrifuges eventually broke down or the uranium that was enriched was not of good quality. So in essence, the Confico worm were able to create an impact that you could create, for example, with a kinetic attack. You could, they were able to basically delay this whole nuclear program by approximately two to three years. Uh, this was very, very well made. It had, it had demanded a very long time of preparation and actually tailoring this goal and getting it in and so on. So you could see that this was, this was clearly no hacktivist group. It was the state that was behind it. Why is Stuxnet still important? Stuxnet is important because this was the big eye-opener globally to cyber, the cyber threat and also to the national cyber threat. As I said earlier, before this, um, we had all the time heard when we were talking about the possibility of attacks like this is that it's just the nerds having very vivid dreams. We are creating scientific scenarios and these things will not happen. This is just the stories for, for movies and so on. But clearly, in, in this case, this showed that this is not just the stories for movies. This is actually something for the, for the real world. And this is actually the attack that started the discussions also on higher levels, like political levels, that we need to really take the cyber threat into consideration and take it seriously and do things about it. So I think that even if you could say that it was, um, it was in a sense, a horrible attack, it was in many ways also good for the whole cyber discussion. And I would say that after this game changer, the discussions on different national levels started to change. Then in 2013, we had also an attack uh, to the Ministry for Foreign Affairs in Finland, and I usually call this the Stuxnet of Finland, not because it would have been as uh, advanced, it, we were talking about the breach into the, the networking systems of the Ministry for Foreign Affairs. But this is what got the discussion in Finland really going, is that these things can really happen to us. Because I think that we have one main sin here in Finland. We are so used to being just in on our own little safe heaven and bad things only happen to other countries, but never to us. And this was a good wake-up call that all these things are also relevant for us. And yes, we can see state behavior also in our networks. So this was, um, this was a very good, um, very good incident. I'm not, I'm not allowed to say that, but let's, <laughs> let's say that it was um, an eye-opening incident also in Finland. And it also happened to be coming, coming the very same year that our first national cybersecurity strategy came up so that definitely fueled the discussion. 
Then in 2016, 2017, we started to see attacks more like ransomware. Also, the Petya, not Petya, had had also a lot to do with the situation in Ukraine. The WannaCry had lots to do with with North Korea, and actu it was actually attributed to North Korea, and so on and so forth. So there are a lot of these examples, and if you are interesting, there's actually this uh, center for strategic and international studies. They conducted a study of uh, attacks done between 2006 and 2018 uh, based on open sources, that what are the things we have seen? And they ruled out at, uh, situations from cyber crime. So they were looking mostly at the significant cyber incidents that are more like nation-based or nation-originated. So if you're interested to look at more incidents, then do have a look at at that one. And actually based on that report, uh, there was this article in the US news that China and Russia are the biggest cyber offenders. And for example, looking at this report, and as I said, this is only based on, on open source um, incident, they said pretty much that 108 cyber incidents could be attributed to China. And the losses amounted to $1 million per cyber incident. Russia, on the other hand, was attributed 98 major cyber incidents, where also the losses were accounted to more than $1 million each. Of course, the targets were a little bit different depending on the political situation, but still we are talking about big numbers. And if you look, for example, at this report, I had to write this up, because they were swimming in data on China, North Korea, Iran, India, Russia, the United Kingdom, the United States, Germany, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Ukraine, Israel, and France. And then the rest of the world was uh, listed as a separate category. And the study named actually the rest of the world as the third worst offender with 67 incidents. Next in the ranking came Iran with 44 incidents and then North Korea with 38 incidents. India was listed guilty of 16 important cyber incidents and the US was accused of nine. And according to this uh, article, just two countries were identified as not having been the source of cyber attacks and that was um, Japan and Australia. So it's, uh, it was a pretty interesting report, but as I said, based mostly on, on open information. So now talking a little bit about attribution. If you say that country X did something, it's quite a heavy claim. You ha are you able to prove it? And if you're not, then what are you, what are you sort of shouting about? So basically attribution, what it means, uh, it means that it's the identification of the actor who is guilty of a cyber attack. And uh, there's this guide by, uh, published by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence in the US called a guide to cyber attribution. And they claim that uh, attribution is difficult, but it's not impossible. So they use a, cert a few uh, key indicators to do this. One is, for example, the tradecraft. What is the behavior of the actor? Because I mean, can, you can change your tools and y your mechanism, but you might have a certain behavior that you are used to, which can be maybe identified unless someone is, is copying it. Uh, infrastructure, I mean, actors can, for example, they can build their own infrastructure, they can lease infrastructure, they can compromise infrastructure and use that as part of their attacks. Then there's malware that is used, what kind of malware, what kind of techniques do we see in, in malware, what's the intent, who is, uh, for example, what is the intent of a certain group or a certain nation that also affects who is targeted and how this, uh, this uh, party is, is targeted. And also external sources. So of course, you might get information from, for example, the private sector or from other authorities and so on. And by combi combining this information, you might get other indicators that you have yourself. Then, of course, there's the best practices, human error. I mean, attackers are human as well. They also make mistakes, and many times one of the mistakes can actually get you a lead on to the fact that now something has happened and also help you catching the operation or catching the, the attack. Of course, information exchange, collaboration, and on also your 
ability to do analysis. And you also need to do a gap analysis. So what is the information that we have? What are the, is the information that we need? What are the gaps? Do we have a reasonably, are you reasonably confident to say that yes, we can attribute this attack to country X or not? And that then guides you on whether you respond or how you respond to, to this situation. And what are your possibilities then with, when it comes to a cyber response? Well, of course, as with everything, diplomacy. That's, I would say, a very good way to, to deal with threats, whether they are cyber or otherwise. And diplomacy should always try be the, the first attempt. Of course, when it comes to attribution, the naming and shaming game, so publicly claim that this other party has, has done it and see how it affects sanctions is also one option, for example, putting sanctions on trade or putting sanction on people, how they can travel and enter, for example, the European Union or a country and so on. Then there are the countermeasures, theoretically possible, in some cases even practically um, a possibility, whether they are then, well, the best way to go about it, that can be debated, but okay, it's an option. And then, of course, we always have the kinetic response. And up until last May, we had never seen a kinetic response to a cyber threat or cyber operation. But now what happens was that the Hamas was threatening Israel or the Israeli society, and Israel actually responding by bombing the, the building where the Hamas cyber officials were residing. So here you can see actually the tweet that uh, the Israeli Defense Forces put out. We thwarted an attempted Hamas cyber offensive against Israeli targets. Following our successful cyber defensive operation, we targeted a building where the Hamas cyber operatives work. And they claim to have wiped out the cyber capabilities of Hamas for the time being. So now we have seen the first kinetic response to cyber operations. Who knows, is this opening the Pandora's box or not? What will we see happening after this? Talking a little bit about international aspects, of course, countries are building their cyber capabilities, but cyber defense and cyber security is also discussed in the international arena. For example, when we talk about NATO or we talk about the EU. If you look at NATO and EU, they are a little bit different as organizations. For example, NATO is, is a political and military alliance, whereas the European Union is a political and uh, economical union. NATO has 29 member states, the European Union has 28 member states. Most of them are the same, but then there are some who are NATO members, but not EU members, and vice versa. Also, the decision-making process is a little bit different. So, for example, in NATO, you have uh, the decision-making uh, decision is based on consensus, so everyone has to agree, whereas in the European Union, Union it's a little bit more complex. You have the, the intergovernmental and uh, all the other parliaments, etc. So there are, there are a lot of differences also in their tasks and in their mandates, but nonetheless these two organizations are, are very important, I would say, especially in the Western world and in the European arena. So let's take a quick look at what is happening uh, both at NATO and, and in the e EU. So if you look at NATO and cyber defense, NATO usually says that their cyber defense is not about a revolution, but rather an evolution. So for, for example, in 2002, this was the first time that cyber defense actually came on the political agenda of the alliance. And it was at this time that the NSERC, the computer incident response capability, was established. In 2008, and this was one year after the bronze statue in Tallinn, and this also raised the issue very much in NATO that these things can happen. So this was when a foundation was raised that NATO also needs to take these, uh, these th things more seriously. And out of this came the first policy on cyber defense. The second policy on cyber defense came in 2011, when NATO started to centralize their, their functions. So for example, now the NSERC uh, also took a lot of uh, responsibilities when it came to monitoring the network. So 
things started to be centralized more to one organization rather as being distributed over the alliance. Then in 2014, NATO was talking about an enhancement, and this is actually when we were starting, or NATO started to talk about cyber as collective defense. So collective defense, then we come to Article 5, which means that if one NATO uh, member is attacked, then that's this an attack on everyone, and that usually invokes the Article 5. And in this case, it's often questioned that uh, what, how would Article 5 would be invoked in a cyber case? And the answer to that would be that on a case-by-case case case basis, as with every other thing, and one have to remember that there's only one time in NATO's history that Article 5 has been invoked, and that was with the World Trade Center attacks and 9-11. Uh, so this question is not really a cyber-specific question. But if someone would, re would invoke it, then it would be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Also, uh, in 2014, it was realized that international law applies, just that this applies in, in other aspects as well. Then in 2016, in the Warsaw, then we're talking about adaptation. So in 2016, NATO actually identified uh, cyber as a domain. And then NATO started to transit from more from information assurance to mission assurance. So it was kind of a change in the way of thinking. And also there was this cyber defense pledge where the NATO members actually agreed to spend a certain amount of money and resources on protecting their own infrastructures from the cyber threats. And maybe one of the more remarkable changes that happened was the NATO-EU collaborations. So for example, NATO and EU agreed on over 40 measures where the both organizations could collaborate on, for example, cyber and hybrid and, and so on. So this was also a significant development in the whole cyber defense issue. Then in 2018, it was talked about, for example, cyberspace operations center that one of these will be established and then also the possibility for NATO to draw on national cyber capabilities. And the summit of 2019 is still to be had. It will be in December. But if you look at some of the, the documents that have come out, then it said that NATO needs to use all the tools at its disposal, including political, diplomatic, and military, to tackle the cyber threats that it faces. So if we want to anticipate what will be the declaration after the next summit, it will probably be something in the line of, of this. Then looking at the European Union, I just checked that I'm not going over time. Probably not, but I will round this up quickly. So the European Union, it has broader scope than in the sense that it's also tackling cybersecurity. One of the newest uh, changes is the Cybersecurity Act that came out in April 2019, where the EU agreed on a system on EU-wide certification schemes, and also the introduction of an EU cyber security agency. But in parallel with these two efforts, EU will also fight against organized crime. They come up with a common foreign and security policy that also comprises cyber security, and then also cyber defense will be one one issue, and the EU has been working for a long time on cyber defense, for example, through the European Defense Agency. So to come to my final, final slide, um, cyber defense in the future, what are we looking at? First of all, I think that the digital battlefield is the whole society. Since we are becoming more and more digitalized, everything we do, all the functions are critical infrastructures, the way we live our personal lives. When we go out jogging, we have a lot of computers on us. When we talk to our refrigerator, it's a computer. Our car is a computer. Everything is basically a computer. And if we are thinking about, for example, things from a war fighting perspective, then war is not necessarily just about, well, killing the enemy. It's more or less about uh, May convincing the enemy that they do not want to fight us. And uh, in this sense, uh, this whole distinction between cyber security and cyber defense will diminish because of, because of the depend dependency we have on our system. So if we want to take away the will of a society to fight, take away their heating, take away their food, take away their transportation, take away their communication, just 
paralyze a society. You, don't, you might not even have to start the fi first fight. You might not have to throw the first stone. So in this sense, cybersecurity and cyber defense will be more and get closer and closer to each other. Of course, the digitalization and integration of the battlefield with, will continue. The weapon systems are 50% explosive, 50% computers. Computers are everywhere in that sense as well. And also, I talk about the return of the info domain because info domain is more about using information and misinformation to affect decision making. And it can target, for example, people also on an individual level. But now we have the cyber domain that provides a perfect medium for spreading the information or misinformation and doing information campaigns. We are not throwing leaflets out of airplanes anymore necessarily. Why? Because we can target you personally. With respect to this, cybersecurity and defense become increasingly important because we really need to protect the data, to protect the information. And also if we are looking into the future, or it's already here, for example, artificial intelligence and machine learning, the quality of the data is crucial. So for example, if we have functions that are relying more and more on the things that the artificial intelligence is doing, artificial intelligence learn from the data we give it. Well, what if we maliciously affect the data? What if we make artificial intelligence learn what we want them to learn and not what the other opponent wants it to learn? And vice versa, we need to protect our data from someone tampering it so that, for example, the functions that we are doing will be what we want them to be and not what the enemy or an opponent wants them to be. So looking at this whole digitalization, it brings a lot of challenges for cyber, but it also emphasizes the fact that cyber security and cyber defense become much more important also in the future. So with this, I will conclude my presentation. And if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take some. Yes. Check, check. Yes, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is uh, an observation. You, you can talk about the technical components. Uh, you can talk about the military components. But when it comes to the issue of response, that has to be a deeply political discussion. Um, you've got uh, the ladder of escalation has infinitely many rungs. Uh, there's a whole question of asymmetric warfare. Do you feel that governments are now properly equipped in their uh, to handle the political aspects of this, do they have the expertise? Uh, do they do they know how to handle this? That's my question. Uh, it's a very good question. I think governments are getting much better at this. If you had asked this question from me 10 years ago, I would have said absolutely not. But I think we have had so many wake-up calls that now these things are taken seriously also on a governmental level. So even if the governments would not be uh, like super good at tackling events. They are aware of them and things are being done, for example, on situational awareness, on uh, the authorities collaborating, working with the private sector, also ensuring the vital functions of preparing already for things possibly going wrong. So there's a lot of work that is going on and I think that today we are better prepared and there is the awareness of these threats and they are being taken seriously. So in that sense, I would say a very, a very vague yes, but there's still things that we, we need to do. And I think there's a lot of work needs to be done, for example, to the real leadership that if and when this attack comes and we are talking about the peacetime scenario, then how do we really as a society respond when things start to fall away or things start to blur out? So we, we have work to do, but we are much better equipped than five or 10 years ago. Any other questions? Hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah, so thank you very, uh, very much for the presentation. I just want to ask, um, what do you see from your own perspective? What will be the future of the cyber defense or security strategies of um, the different countries um, who are 
in this case, uh, preparing for any potential cyber attack, um, for example, in the next, say, 15, 20 years, um, learning from the dynamics, um, the different shapes and dimensions that the different cyber attacks are evolving, what do you think about the future? How frequently w will the countries be attacked and how do you think they would respond? Thank yeah, you. So I'll start with the first question that how often will countries be attacked? I would say all the time and this will not go away. The point is more that uh, I would say that being attacked is the new normal. So if you don't know that, you're, that there's an attack or if you don't see an attack or you don't know anything, then you are missing something. Uh, I think one thing that will happen is that countries will realize even more than today that you really can't go it alone. You need to collaborate. We need to get better at exchanging information. And then also countries at the moment are at a very different level when it comes to cyber capabilities and cyber hygiene. So I think that those countries who are now more advanced will have a big job also in helping the countries that are less advanced because the countries who are less advanced, they are not in their own bubble. Things going bad for them will also affect us. So I think that when it comes to dealing with things on an international level, I think there will be a lot more collaboration and I think we have to learn to collaborate better also in the cyber cyber realm, exchanging information, practicing and exercising together, doing education programs together, and so on. So I think that is one thing that will happen in the next 10 years, is really the closing up on the inf international collaboration, which is a good thing. Yes. Um, you mentioned, um, you touched upon the effects on civil society, and for example, infrastructure, and the deterrent effect that this would have on certain attackers. One thing I, that I see missing from this, though, is a discussion of uh, the electoral process of elections. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of discussion now about disinformation, fake news, whatever, its role in swaying elections. There's also the question of technical methods of hacking national election systems. Uh, that this was left, that this is omitted from this topic, uh, is that by design, is it intended to be left to national governments to sort out, or is this something that there can be cooperation on? Yeah, this is a very good question. So the question was about the, the elections and a very crucial question if you think about the, the, our democracies. There are two ways to look at, uh, at the elections. There's the cyber and then there's the info, info side. So cyber would b the cyber upside of this would be that you would actually hack into the election system. Let's say that there have been electronic voting and you would change the votes and in that way affect the outcome. The info ops to this is to use the cyber domain and the social media to affect how people vote. And this has clearly been the bigger issue now in the, in the last few years. So yes, very crucial, very crucial questions and things that we are going to have to deal with. I think this is also going to be a big uh, discussion point, or it is already on the international collaboration level to see, for example, there's a lot of eyes have been on the US election lately. And also everywhere there is now an election, there is eyes on what is happening. Are we seeing any tries to, to, for example, influence the voting or seeing attacks on the actual election system. So there, there is a lot of eyes on this. And I think that, for example, by looking at the best practices and also looking at the incidents internationally, we are going to be better prepared to protect our election process. And we have to be because if the election process fails, then our democracy fails. So I would say that's one of the bigger questions. Yeah, and uh, one could also argue that it could be the incentive for someone to create a lot of insecurity, for example, in Europe, which is, uh, well, a continent with a lot of small countries that alone are weak, but together are strong. So if we could affect elections and attitudes in the way that, for example, the Euro European Union started to lose its grip, then we are already on a slippery slope.
more questions? If not, then thank you very much for your attention. I know it's late, so you must be tired already, but thank you very much. It was very nice to be back here. Thank you, Katarina.